Hey there. Today we will be talking about anesthesia. Anesthesia is one of the biggest medical breakthroughs of all time. It has opened the door to countless life-saving procedures which have never before been possible. But where did anesthesia come from? Anesthesia hasn't always been the safe and controlled process we see today. Traces of anesthesia date back to the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Indians, and Chinese. At this time, substances like alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, and opium were used as anesthetics, often in unsafe doses. Although this was successful at dulling the pain, it wasn't until the mid-1840s that a major breakthrough was made in the world of anesthetics. This breakthrough came in the form of ether, which was publicly demonstrated in 1846. From there, Joseph Clover was the first person to administer chloroform in known concentrations through the Clover bog, and went on to become the leading anesthesiologist of London. It is important to note that anesthetics took a long time to catch on, since at this time, pain was seen as a necessity to surgery, as it meant the patient was still alive. So what are the different types of anesthesia? There are four common types of anesthesia, twilight, local, regional, and general, each with their own purpose and use. Twilight and local anesthesia numbs specific smaller body parts like the hand, wrist, and is most commonly found in dental surgery. Regional and general anesthesia widen to larger parts or the whole body to block pain sensation. Typically, this is done by a combination of drugs in the blood and inhaled gas. Today, we will be focusing on general anesthesia. How is general anesthesia administered? First of all, there are some medications you might need to avoid before undergoing anesthesia, or some precautions you might need to take if you have certain conditions. Therefore, make sure to discuss with your doctor or anesthesiologist before surgery. There are three major periods to general anesthesia, induction, maintenance, and emergence. During induction, a small dose of hypnotic drug is administered, for example, propofol. This induces a state of sedation in which the patient is calm and easily arousable and maybe has their eyes closed. As more of the hypnotic agent is administered, an increasingly irregular respiratory pattern develops that progresses to apnea, at which bag mask ventilation is needed to support breathing. Medications are used to control increased heart rate and maintain blood pressure during this stage. Next, we enter the maintenance stage. Maintenance involves a combination of hypnotic drugs, inhalation agents, opioids, muscle relaxants, sedatives, CV drugs, and ventilatory and thermal regulatory support. During this stage, the anesthesiologist will monitor your blood pressure and heart rate, as well as your EEG patterns. This is important since surgery will be performed during the maintenance stage. Finally, the patient will enter the emergence stage. This is a passive process that depends on the amount of drug administered, their site of action, potency and pharmacokinetics, patient's physiological characteristics, and type and duration of the surgery. The number one sign to look for in this stage is a return to spontaneous respiration, signaling proper emergence from the anesthetic. At this point, the patient will regain consciousness and breathe on their own. Some additional monitoring is required before the patient is allowed to leave the hospital. We know how the other kinds of anesthetics work, but what about general anesthesia? Despite being used for over 150 years, the mechanism behind general anesthesia's ability to induce unconsciousness is not well understood. It is known that they cause a reduction in the transmission between the synapses of your brain. However, how this inhibition occurs is not well known. If you weren't already aware, synapses are the connections in your brain that allow communication. There are two main reasons why it's difficult to determine precisely how anesthesia works. First, they bind so weakly to their targets that the concentration needed to yield results is extremely high. This is a problem since it crowds the proteins they bind to, making it difficult to see what's really going on. Secondly, anesthesia tends to act on proteins in a highly fat environment. This is a problem since it's unclear if the mechanism of action is on the fat which then affects the protein or directly on the protein itself. In other words, there is simply too much going on at their site of action to truly determine how they work. So, are there risks to general anesthesia? There is always risk to surgery. However, general anesthesia is a surprisingly safe process. Certain factors such as age, obesity, high blood pressure, and alcoholism can increase the risk of general anesthesia. Despite this, Death due to general anesthesia is very rare. 
one in every 100,000 to 200,000 people. When it is all said and done, the benefit of inducing an unconscious state during surgery far outweighs the potential of something going wrong with the procedure. One major risk of general anesthesia is unintended intraoperative awareness, or anesthesia awareness. This refers to the phenomenon where a patient becomes aware of their surroundings during a procedure, even sometimes reporting the sensation of pain. This can obviously have serious psychological ramifications and is currently the subject of heavy research. Again, since we do not know the exact mechanism of general anesthesia, it is tough to determine the cause of anesthesia awareness. It should also be noted that this phenomenon is very rare, one in every 19,000, and should never scare a patient away from what could be a necessary surgery. Overall, it is important to be honest with your anesthesiologist about your health and especially your drug and alcohol use as this can have an impact on the dosage required.